Bitcoin volatility should continue to decline for a long time as it gains maturity, gains adoption, it gains uh, more use, and it's doing that. I don't see what will make it stop doing what it's been doing for the last 10 years, and that's going up. 10x over one year, um, there's too many players and people involved now, I think, that for that to happen. Hi everyone, I'm Giovanni, your host. Welcome back to our show. Today, we are cutting through the noise of catchy price predictions and speculation and look at Bitcoin and crypto markets from a data-driven, research-based perspective. I'm joined by Michael McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mike. Hello, Giovanni. Thanks for having me. So first of all, can you shortly introduce yourself and tell us about your background and what you do at Bloomberg Intelligence? You got it right. I'm Senior Commodity and Crypto Strategist at Bloomberg. Um, I've been in this business, I really started in the trading business, in the trading pits in Chicago in the 80s. And um, commodities and crypto is the main thing I really do at Bloomberg. My main focus is the outlook. I'm not a fan of big intros, so people can always go to LinkedIn or wherever and find more details. But that's my main purpose here is trying to figure out where markets are going and why. Um, and um, I've been quite bullish in Bitcoin for a little while. And we can take it from there. Right. So what would be the connection between commodities and crypto? Well, I, I always go right to gold. To me, Bitcoin has been a digital version of gold since its inception, and it's becoming more so every day. So the direct correlation I have is really towards gold. And gold is really not a commodity. It's a store value diversifier. Historically, it's been considered money. Um, and to me, that's where the two really connect. Um, and that's the most significant place connect maybe a little bit to silver um and then there's all the other cryptos it depends how much we want to talk about those and my main focus is really lately because a macro is more um bitcoin in one of your latest analysis on bloomberg intelligence you said that bitcoin has the chance to go up to half a million dollars but also completely fail and go to zero so what are the factors which could lead to these two opposite outcomes well, I, th I, I guess it's a bit of a cop out to say that I think Bitcoin is going to continue to appreciate in price. It could get to that that five hundred thousand dollar market cap, and that was kind of a lift. That um, that's the one. Some analysts have used that level as the, if it's equivalent to the market cap of gold. Um, and I think the Winklevoss twins recently did a piece of research on that. Um, I don't know what it's going to take to fail. There's so many things with the nascent technology like this that I can't really predict. And we could list a number of those. I'd rather not go there so much. But I look at it continuing to succeed and appreciate. And the way I look at Bitcoin is every day that goes by, it's succeeded. It's becoming, um, I see nothing but more adoption, um, more uh, demand. And the key thing from a commodity standpoint, something I've never, ever seen before is the supply is limited by code where it'll never be affected by price and i see supply declining now it's been like uh, next year be two percent it'll increase the year after that i'll be two 1.7 percent and continue to decline versus i look at gold a good way to bring out more gold is to have the price go up and that's you can't do that with back bitcoin so the only thing that matters is adoption i see those trends um quite um favorable Okay, so you compare Bitcoin to gold. So I understand that the difference between gold and Bitcoin is that Bitcoin can potentially fail and gold cannot. Am I correct? Well, there, there is, <laughs> I, I, you might have not have heard of the phone. There was, used to be a, a TV show in the US called The Twilight Zone. And it's from the 50s. I remember when my famous episode was about a bunch of guys who stole some gold and went to a time machine and went 50 years ahead and gold was worthless. What's that? Gold, that's what he said it was. You want to give it to me in exchange for a lift into town. Gold? Now, what in the world would he be doing with this gold? I don't know. He's probably off his rocker. So as a historical example from, uh, you know, 70 years ago, of gold actually not having value anymore. So there's anything, you know, it's a new technology like this can, you know, Bitcoin could fail as gold could become um, something that, you know, people said, oh, we find an asteroid loaded with gold will just massively increase the supply and reduce um, price. The key thing for Bitcoin to me is it's um, unique technology and it's not the liability of anybody else like gold. You look at all the other 7,000 cryptos of virtually anybody else's project. Bitcoin is neutral and it's the one that's been adopted. It's the first. Um, and I'm not so much a fan of it. I just reflect as this neutral com commodity strategist. And that's the key thing I need to bring out is I have no vested interest in either way. At Bloomberg, my main focus is getting it right. 
um, because I report, I, main thing is I publish on the Bloomberg terminal. And what I see for Bitcoin is prices continue to appreciate. And something needs to change in this increasing adoption in this world of macro economics where we're um, the US the US and virtually every central bank in the world is printing a lot of money and liquidity and yields are near zero that this global decentralized unique um, electronic money um, should not appreciate in price I don't see what would make it stop appreciating price I don't see what will make it stop doing what's been doing for the last 10 years and that's going up right so you pointed the limited supply of Bitcoin as its core feature uh, because as the demand for Bitcoin increases and the, the supply of Bitcoin remains fixed, then its price is bound to increase. Still, um, how do we know that this demand for Bitcoin is actually increasing? What are the main indicators which you're looking at that uh, shows this increase in demand? So these are um, some of the charts we'll be able to show. There's a few things I watch. Um, First of all, let's look at some um, demand indicators. One of the key, significant indicators is on-chain. On-chain indicators, you have um, um, addresses used. Addresses used, I get from coin metrics, and they've been increasing significantly. And that was one of the significant, I watched the 30-day average um, back in 2008, when addresses used plunge, it was a good indication of the market declining, and they've been marching higher. And if I just use a normal analysis, auto scale basis, based on addresses used for the last two or three years against the price of Bitcoin, the price should be closer to 15,000 um, <clears> because <throat> they've been advancing. Another key indicator I watch is um, demand from regulated exchanges and, and investments. And the most significant is, um, is um, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust GBTC. Now that's been advancing rapidly. The total amount in the GBTC is around the equivalent of about 450 bitcoins, 450,000. And if you look at the amount of inflows and appreciation, just the last six months, three months or so, with the halving and bitcoin supply declining, just this one product, which represent, represents something that trades on exchange and is regulated, <clears throat> is absorbing about 30% of new supply. So, as a strategist, something that's taking that much supply and there's no increased supply, the price by economic rules has to go up. And the third measure I watch a lot is, um, um, well, second measure, I should say, th third, I, there's four, is futures, futures open interest. Now, futures open interest are not significant, equivalent of Bitcoin's maybe 50 to 60,000, but the, the point is they're moving from lower left to upper right, and that represents, um, futures represent um, U.S. regulation getting into space, meaning they're regulated by U.S. Um, regulator, which has been one of the key issues here for an ETF. So if you look at Bitcoin overlaid with the NASDAQ, they reached the same level um, about, I'm going to pull up this chart so I can see it as I speak to it, and about in 2017 at about 6,000. That's when Bitcoin first reached 6,000 and NASDAQ was 6,000. So they basically reached one to one. And since that time, actual volatility on Bitcoin has just declined a lot and NASDAQ volatility has gone up. So if you look at the ratio of volatility in Bitcoin, I'm using 260 days or basically an annualized measure to measure apple to apples on an annual basis. The volatility now on Bitcoin is about two times that is of the NASDAQ composite, which means that risk factor is two times. In the past, it's been as high as seven or eight times. So it's pointing out that this new asset class that's only been around for 10 years is becoming um, less and less volatile. And the older asset class, i.e. the stock market, is becoming more and more volatile. Now, they're not there completely one to one, but at only two to one, that's the least, I would say, risky on this measure that Bitcoin's ever been versus the NASDAQ. And they're still at about a one-to-one -one ratio. The NASDAQ's around 1,100 Bitcoins, just below this 10,000. 10, so that to me gives Bitcoin the upper hand in appreciation. And typically when the volatility gets this low, it's never been this low, when it picks up, it usually favors Bitcoin. Got it, okay. But on the other hand, many people see volatility as a positive factor, which could bring huge upsides to Bitcoin. So if volatility decreases, those upsides would be more limited. So do you see decrease in Bitcoin's volatility as a net positive for Bitcoin? Um, well, let's put it this way. Bitcoin's a nascent technology. And when it was first got started trading volatility, it was extremely high. Bitcoin volatility should continue to decline for a long time as it gains maturity, gains adoption, it gains uh, more use. And it's doing that. That depends on which measure you watch. I watch in the big picture, 
an annualized measure. So that should continue to happen. The point is, historically, when Bitcoin's rallied, it's usually broken out in price and volatility has gone up. When it goes up too much, it gets too speculative, it gets too high, i.e. 2017, and then it crashes. Now that's what's happened since. We're, what we're doing right now in terms of a market, as a market person looks at it, it got parabolically too expensive, just like the NASDAQ did in 2000, 1999, 2000. It's correcting and it's building a base for the next extension of the bull market. And to do that, typically volatility has to decline. And oftentimes what happens historically in markets, you need a period of disdain or underperformance. And we're having that now. It's the third year now, the market hasn't made a new high, which is good. It's building a base, as we would say in markets, building a base for continued appreciation. And for it to not do that, I need signs of negativity, i.e. less adoption, um, something that would make me tilt my bias negative, and I see the opposite. I see more adoption. So just like gold did, remember gold went up to 1900, it crashed to 1000, it built the base, it, it was underperformed for five years, and then it started breaking out. To me, Bitcoin's just doing that, and it's following gold. I can mention gold because the correlation between the two, depending on how you measure it, is the highest ever. Okay, so that's interesting because a lot of people coming on our show like to make quite daring price predictions. We had Dan Moorhead from Pantera Capital explaining me how Bitcoin could go up to 115,000 by August 2021. If you take the stock to flow from the first two halvings and extrapolate it out to the third, it would imply a price of $115,000 dollars per Bitcoin in August of next year. So probably from your point of view, these kind of predictions uh, are not that realistic and not even desirable. Well, I, I, there's different reasons for those types of predictions. Number one, there's someone with a bias, someone trying to sell a product on the sell side um, and who benefits from that. I don't. I'm, I have to have a realistic view. Is it going up or down? And um, remember, I'm just a strategist and I'm publish on Bloomberg, my primary purpose is publishing and getting things right. So sometimes that also gets headlines. It's how you get readership. Um, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you, if Bitcoin was at hundred dollars, no one would care, but things like that get headlines, get readership and gets interest. And so there's ulterior motives there, whether it's right or wrong, that's oftentimes subject, but I do think the price is going to appreciate. I don't know how much I'm getting closer to thinking it might get towards the capitalization of gold, that was just before our conversation today, I was comparing Bitcoin to the capitalization of the NASDAQ. It's just a small fraction, which shows you in a way how small the Bitcoin market is, less than 200 billion. That, that's just my, my point. Sometimes I'll put out a point like I recently pointed out Bitcoin should hold support at 10,000 and appreciate. Right. So according to your sober point of view, Bitcoin's volatility is decreasing. That is why we should expect a gradual appreciation and not something like 10x in one year from now. I'm glad you brought that. It's a good point. And the key narrative I like to use is Bitcoin should continue doing what it's been doing, but at a much slower pace, at much later. So right now, annualized volatility in Bitcoin, as I, I'm just pulling up a chart right now, is about 62%. That's just an annual volatility. The high um, in 2017, when it was on that roar, was around 100%. Um, and that's just a measure of volatility. The all-time low for this measure of volatility was 37%, and that was 2016, right before the breakout. So that's how it works. And, um, but remember, when it starts at a penny, and it's, no one knows about it, a lot of people disagree with it, and it becomes increasingly adopted, that's the exciting part. Now, this Bitcoin is not a child anymore. It's more of, I would say, a young adult in terms of assets becoming into the fray. There's probably going to be an ETF soon. There's I see a lot of institutional get investors getting into it, a lot more hedge funds, lots more traders, like I used to be a trader. Traders are about the volatility, but 10X, maybe over 10 years, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. 10X over one year, um, there's too many players and people involved now, I think, that for that to happen. And it's already had massive appreciation. So I think it's just gonna do what it's been doing, but slower. So a lot of price predictions are based on the past performance of Bitcoin after the halvings. So people look at the previous behaviors of Bitcoin following the halving and they see this massive appreciation and they say, oh, Bitcoin will do the same after this last halving. However, uh, the sample of previous halvings is too small to base uh, some price prediction on this. Am I correct? I, I like that analogy. You basically have to use, you know, past performance may rhyme with, um, you know, current conditions may rhyme, the history will, will rhyme with history, but we have to factor in the fact that how new and nascent the market was. Um, and the having meant vault, I mean, actual annualized supply was going from, let's say 20%, increasing 20% annual basis to 10%. Now, 
last few years it was four or five percent now it's dropping to two percent you see that's going fractionally towards zero a hundred years from now so it's just part of the maturity of how it was set up which i'm somewhat impressed by that those examples in the past are history so i recently had a big investor ask me about supply and the mining and i said it doesn't matter and he said why well it doesn't matter anymore now it used to because in before this year, there was 1,800 coins a day that was produced. Now it's only 900. Four years from now, it's only gonna be 450. That's done. Unless something changes with that, that I can't predict, that's just it. That's how the supply is. So as a strategist, I can see where that's going. It's increasing. It used to increase like this on an annual basis. Now it's increasing like this, and that's gonna increase like this. So all that matters is demand because supply is fixed. So that's why I always go back to the history doesn't matter as much anymore. It's looking forward and trying to extrapolate what that means compared to when it was much of a younger asset. So in the same analysis we were talking about, you predicted that stablecoin Tether will overtake Ethereum as a number two crypto by market cap next year. Why do you think so? I appreciate you mentioning earlier. This is simple analysis of the linear regression of the facts. Unless the pace of, of increasing market capitalization of Tether changes, unless um, and keeping at the same pace, come with less than a year, Tether around 14 billion right now will surpass the market cap of of, of the second number two theorem, which is around 30 billion. And to me, that's significant because first of all, you have to analyze, this is simple pattern recognition, trend analysis, analysis of what's happening. Tether and stable coins are becoming increasingly adopted at an exponential pace. And they have a lot of fundamental backing behind them, i.e. every central bank in the world is considering going um, digital, central bank digital currencies. This is just an ind indication of where they're going. Um, the thing about Ethereum is I see it's getting increasing demand from DEXs and decentralized finance and things. But the issue with Ethereum is there's 7,000 other cryptocurrencies and 7,000 other platforms. There's many other platforms that are competing against its for its business. Now, it might be the main one. It might win. It might be like an Amazon. But the point is, I like to differentiate. There's Bitcoin in the cryptocurrencies markets, and then there's everything else. Bitcoin's number one. Ethereum's number two with like one-fifth the size. And Tether's number, number three. Soon it's going to be Tether unless things change, which will define really what cryptocurrencies are, be, are becoming. There's gold, there's the US dollar becoming, um, you know, the world stable currency, becoming transactable via the, the blockchain, and then there's everything else. And there's 7,000 everything else, which is kind of where I get somewhat confused. I wouldn't say so confused. I measure the market, and I view that's a different, whole different place. When there's so many of them, I only focus on the one or two that matter. The key thing recent, recently for me was Ethereum got a little, showed indications of speculative excess, but it got around to around 5,000. It was really expensive up there. It had big gaps below and just way too much excess. And the same time, same thing with the NASDAQ. Now they're very highly correlated. And now drop back to around 350. I do free, view 350 as a first good support um, for the market to continue to advance. But I don't follow as much. I'm, I know less about it. And I'm more focused on the macro um, supply and demand factors of Bitcoin. You also said that the rise of Tether will have a negative impact on altcoins in general, but a positive impact on Bitcoin. Why do you think so? It has been. That's just, uh, let's focus on what it has been doing. Altcoins have been declining in value, uh, maybe it was certainly since the 2017 peak. Tether has been appreciating exponentially. Around that time it was one or two billion, now it's 14. Um, and the reason is there's, I like to use the word, crypto assets because oftentimes they like to call themselves cryptocurrencies. Well, they're not really currencies. They're not stores of value, units of exchange and mediums of exchange. They're highly speculative digital assets, which is okay. I remember, look at my hair. I used to be a speculator. I used to be in a trading pits. I get speculation. Um, but let's point out what they are. Most of them are copycats and wannabes of Bitcoin. And Tether, the key thing it has going for it is adoption. So here's the key trigger point for Tether. It was last year around April, when the New York Attorney General came down to Tether with some allegations, I don't know, true or false, about them not actually holding the full amount one-to-one -one basis. And the market initially dipped and came right back and then started appreciating more. To me, that was a good indication. The market doesn't care. It wants a central bank digital currency. It views Tether as the one that's being adopted. It wants a way to be able to transact without an intermediary globally, without credit cards and things dollar based and tethers winning that it's based on the world's reserve currency and then the next to tether is gold 
you have gold and you have uh, fiat currencies. Gold, in my mean my terms, in current cryptos is digital. There's Bitcoin, there's Tether, and everything else. Bitcoin is the digital version. It's gold, where there's no one else's project. It's the one being adopted. It has the depth. It has the um, size behind it, and it represents the macro alternative to fiat currencies. So don't you think that the massive growth that we are seeing in DeFi uh, will have a very positive impact on Ethereum? Because, I mean, most of DeFi is built on Ethereum. It is, it has. Greg, so it's one of those known knowns in the market. So I look at a known known, but then why is Tether still, you know, it's, I'm sorry, why is um, Ethereum? It's appreciating. It's appreciated a lot this year, but it's gone up a lot. So a lot of that's priced in because we all know that it's a known known DeFi is picking up DeFi is not going to go backwards i think it's in, in unlikely ethereum is one of the first is a primary platform for DeFi. i get that but if you look at the actual pace of appreciation in assets on, a, on in market cap it's nowhere near an appreciate uh, percentage basis as much as tether yet tether has the same old story and that is it's what i think is happening to paper money two three hundred years ago is but can go in digital. So we have a lot of guests that jump on our channel and predict the end of the US dollar as the reserve currency of the world. Max Kaiser even said that the dollar is going to end up like the Venezuelan Bolivar. So they say that people will, last, will lose trust in the central banks and uh, the whole world will unite uh, around uh, the centralized uh, system based on Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think about this scenario? Is, this, is it something realistic to you? Uh, there's a lot of um, potential behind it. Um, I love that term, Bitcoin maximalist. I do believe that that narrative fits into what I think is happening, and that is the Bitcoin price should continue to appreciate. Um, the market cap of Tether should just continue doing what it's been doing, appreciate it much more rapidly. But as far as this narrative about the dollar um, um, collapse, I've heard that. I'm 55. I've heard it most of my life. And um, America is still the, you know, still the dominant um, police of the world. Um, and as my son, who's a Marine, likes to wear this shirt that says two-time World War II champions, um, you know, it's still a bit of a dominance there. And then there's the whole back behind the dollar. Now, I, the key thing I point out is there needs to be alternatives to it because of what's happening on a global basis, and that is massive amount of liquidity providing every country in the world, zero interest rates, which means a neutral digital currency has by default has to win. And I believe in that max, that narrative to extent, but what do you pay your taxes in? Bottom line, that's what matters. What do you pay your taxes in? Paper money. And you need to have some of that paper money, but you always want to convert a lot of that piece of paper money into relatively secure assets, real estate, stocks, bond, maybe bonds, not anymore, alternative currencies, gold, Bitcoin. It's just called proper diversification, taking that piece of paper we earn, making sure you pay your taxes with it, but also diversifying it properly. And I think Bitcoin's part of that, like real estate. I have, you know, young, my kids are at that age, and I said, buy, borrow as much as you can of that paper, and buy a decent home or piece of property, or and, and make sure Bitcoin's part of that portfolio. Great. Awesome. That was very interesting, Mike. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, Giovanni, thank you very much. It was a pleasure meeting you, and I'm looking forward to um, speaking with you again in the future. That was Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg. I'm Giovanni, your host. If you enjoyed the interview, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.